everyone, and welcome to the 33rd episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfansukanik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, and today I'm speaking with fellow founder of Antinatalism International, co-author of an antinatalist handbook, Responses to Common Natalist Excuses, the founder of the famous Arabic page of Ethelism, and host of the opposite thought, our ambassador to the Arabic antinatalist world, Laith Malik Reem. Welcome, Laith, to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Hey, Amanda. Thank you for hosting me. The pleasure is mine for being with you in this episode for this podcast. So before we begin, I just wanted to inform our audience so that you guys have a bit of context. This is actually not the first time that I've interviewed Laith. Uh, Laith was my guest for the one and only episode of another show that I did for a short time called Evil TV, Antinatalist Television. And I wanted to mention this early in the interview because I will be bringing it up occasionally, so I wanted to let you know what I was referring to, Um, and I wanted to make sure to encourage everybody to go check it out. So Laith, in your words, who is Laith Malik Reem? Laith Malik Reem is an antinatalist, ethelist, vegan, and an animal rights activist. Uh, He's originally Lebanese. He was born on March 26, 1992. Um, He studied in the United States, got his bachelor's degree from uh, the state of New York, and now he currently uh, resides in Bolivia, where he's working. His um, main goal in his life is to reach to as much people as possible uh, about antinatalism, to deliver this message and to preach it so that the message can be delivered to everyone. Laith, in addition to your antinatalist activism, you are, of course, a person who is very passionate about many social causes and ethical issues. Can you tell me a little bit about the other kinds of activism that you've done in the past? Absolutely. So my activism started uh, back in the days in 2008 uh, on Facebook, when Facebook was new back then. And... uh, Uh, We had uh, MSN Messenger at that time, so I used to talk to people a lot in the Middle East about religion and uh, the bad stuff in religion and how that there's no women rights, uh, there's no rights for homosexuals, uh, that religion itself is based on bloody stories, uh, it has a lot of injustice, a lot of murder, uh, and so on. And... uh, That activism put me in so much trouble because at that time, especially in the Middle East, it's it's like a taboo. You cannot speak about this stuff because, uh, you know, it's something sacred for the majority of people. And uh, they are even willing to harm you physically if you speak about their religion only by uh, only by criticizing their religion. So this was a very big problem for me. And when my parents knew about my posts on Facebook and about my activism with people uh, to let them know about uh, how bad is the religion, uh, they got mad. And uh, yeah, I was in so much trouble. So I remember these days very well. Um, But yeah, I stopped speaking about atheism, agnosticism and religion in general. by the end of 2010. So it was for like two years and a half, something like that. Then uh, when the uh, uh, Arab Spring, as they call it, started in uh, 2010, in December, uh, in the Arab world, um, emotionally, um, I I felt uh, bad for the ones who are suffering because of oppression. Uh, political uh, prisoners and uh, all the injustice that was happening whether it's in Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Libya, Yemen, uh, Syria. Uh, Syria played a very very big role in my activism uh, politically. So yeah, I was politically active against the re- Syrian regime, which is now currently in power until now. 
it's been uh, 21 years for this president he's in power until now and uh, the reason why i was politically active is because of the amount of crimes this president has done against his own people and uh, the chemical weapons that he used and so on the way he treated the uh, protesters the peaceful protesters uh, while they were protesting against him and everything so um, yeah i was active politically from 2011 until 2016 uh, also against some uh, political parties in lebanon um, and I, I was living in Lebanon in 2016 and I faced a lot of problems because of my activism against some political parties there. Um, they used to send me uh, death threats and messages and uh, they caused harm to one of my friends and I was uh, in trouble. So I was on the news as well uh, on the uh, on on some Lebanese uh, channels, and uh, yeah, it was terrible. So after that, in two thousand and sixteen, uh, in October, I became uh, vegan and uh, I became an animal rights activist immediately. Uh, the reason behind that is because I listened and I watched uh, the best speech you will ever hear by Gary Yurovsky on uh, YouTube. And he's the one who gave me that push to become an activist as well. So I started preaching veganism, talking about animal rights um, between the people I know. Um, and uh, then I started being more active on social media, doing videos. Uh, I gave a public lecture about veganism in front of uh, 93 or 94 people that I did not know. They were strangers and um, I decided to give this public lecture to let them know about uh, the meat, uh, egg, uh, dairy, fur industries and other industries that uh, cause unnecessary harm to these animals. Um, then I, when I moved to Jordan, I managed to organize a very quick protest inside, uh, the shop of Louis Vuitton, which is, uh, very well known in the world. And, uh, I entered the shop with two more, uh, vegan friends of mine and only because i was speaking to the employees and to the clients inside the shop uh, about how um, this industry works and how they prepare these products that they sell to people how they use the animal skin um, they called the cops and they came and arrested us and yeah i had a lot of problems regarding that uh, then I worked with uh, international animal rights organizations, uh, one of the biggest animal rights organizations in the world. And I worked with another animal rights organization as well, but I'm not going to mention their names because they asked me to keep this confidential. So I'm sorry about this, Amanda. Um, I was sent to slaughterhouses to film what's happening in, uh, inside there to make some short documentaries about it in Jordan. And I was sent as well to Egypt to um, also take some footage of what's happening to camels, horses uh, and mules in, uh, in some touristic places. Uh, places in the pyramids in Cairo uh, and it was awful the experience was uh, terrible because it destroyed me uh, psychologically but then yeah people should know what's gonna happen or what's happening so it was important to do this kind of activism and to do this kind of work and uh, yeah I cannot talk a lot uh, in details about this stuff because all of this is confidential so I'm sorry I cannot give you more information about this 
But uh, yeah, when I moved to Bolivia in 2019, I also met the vegan community here. I did some activism uh, in the Cube of Truth for the Anonymous for the Voiceless and uh, some demonstrations as well. And I'll still continue doing that because it's very, very important. I'm also planning to do some street activism for antinatalism because I haven't done any street activism for antinatalism, but uh, I'll see how, how this is uh, going to work out. Why are you an antinatalist, Leif? And by extension of that, why are you an ethylist? Why am I an antinatalist and an ethylist? Uh, this is actually an interesting question. Now, to answer this question, there are several answers, but to give you the main answer of the first part of the question, which is why I'm an, anti an antinatalist, uh, it's because the act of procreation itself is immoral because it's a false contract between two parties. The first party is the father, the second party is the mother who took a decision and played the card of a third party who was not even mentioned in this false contract. He didn't even sign that contract. So they take this decision and they expose that person to uh, all the things in life, whether they are good or bad things. So this is unacceptable and this is immoral. So procreation in the first place, the act of procreation itself is immoral. That's not, uh, that's, that's if we do not mention uh, the, the bad things in life and uh, what the person might go through in life. So it's only because um, that person had no consent in the first place and they took this decision without uh, considering uh, whether he wants uh, to be playing uh, this game or not, to be part of this game or not. Regarding the second part uh, of the question, why am I an ethelist? Because all sentient beings in this universe suffer in a way or another. They have nervous system, they suffer uh, for no good reason, uh, and uh, the problem is that animals are not aware of what they're doing. So when they have sex, for example, they are not aware of the consequences. They are not aware that the DNA itself controls them. So uh, we cannot preach uh, aphilism by speaking to animals about it because they're not going to understand and they're not going to be aware. Uh, but we can let humans know about this so they can at least uh, have an idea about what's going on and uh, maybe in the near future with technology can do something to sterilize uh, all sentience in a painless way if it's possible. When was the first time you heard the word antinatalism? The first time I heard the word antinatalism was in 2016, uh, while I was scrolling down the newsfeed of uh, my Facebook account. Um, a Lebanese friend of mine, uh, she's an antinatalist and a vegan as well, she published a picture of a demonstration that calls for antinatalism that was in Poland at that time. And the people who were holding the sign or the banner, it was written on it, antinatalism in the Polish language. So, and she wrote something like antinatalism all the way, something like that in her caption, my, my friend. So I was like, what is this word? Like, this is the first time I hear this word. And out of curiosity, I started searching on Google like what is antinatalism, the definition of antinatalism, and then things started popping out. Um, one of them was uh, uh, the video of uh, Mistro of one of his songs about antinatalism, maybe the song Every Cradle. And uh, then, um, yeah, th that was the first time I heard about the word in 2016. Who, if any, have been your biggest antinatalist influences? 
This is a very interesting question. To be honest with you, to be totally frank with you, um, it was you, Amanda Sukinik, old fan, uh, Gary Amendum, and Mistro. Like those three persons, they are the ones who um, gave me all this. Uh, 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 like the, the the thing that that was missing inside the thing that I felt that uh, yeah why why didn't I know about this before like where 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 were I and uh, yeah because of your activism Amanda because of your videos because of your YouTube channel alone it has maybe thousands of videos now because you keep uploading videos and. Uh, how did I know about you is uh, through uh, one of uh, Mistro's song because you participated in the video clip in one of his songs or maybe in, in more than one of his songs, maybe in two of his songs. And then I started searching more. Uh, then I reached out to you on Facebook. As I remember the first time on Messenger, I sent you a private message and you uh, accepted it and you replied. And then we became friends, maybe that was three or four years ago, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then I uh, was introduced to Gary Amendum through his videos as well. And I feel that Gary Amendum is the antinatalist version of uh, Gary Urofsky. Like, they, they, both of them have um, maybe uh the the very good charisma and the same personality and the uh, same amount of influencing others about uh or inspiring others about uh their cause so yeah that was very very interesting to me Leith, as you know, anti-procreation is sometimes broken up into four generalized schools of thought, antinatalism, ethelism, vehement, and child-free. Can you give me your thoughts on each? Of course, of course, Amanda. Um, so regarding uh, this, yes, uh, antinatalism, uh, in my opinion, is the one that should be like the, the main, the main uh part of this cause in general and i think that it's the conclusion of ethelism uh vimt and being child free so it's the one that um uh, includes them all together um then when it comes to ethelism, yeah, as you know, I'm an ethelist, so I call myself an ethelist and I totally agree with this philosophy. And I feel that ethelism is antinatalism plus, and it's very, very important because uh, I, I think that it's uh, the, the only part of this philosophy that is about eliminating suffering from its roots. Uh, regarding uh, the Vimt, um, this movement, uh, it's only about human extinction, so it says nothing about animals, so they have no problem if humans went extinct and uh, animals stay on this planet Earth, because they think that uh, we are the ones who are causing all these problems and that uh, having the animals alone will be like a paradise for them. But that's, that's uh, wrong and I do not agree with this philosophy because even if we go extinct, another species, whether it's in hundreds of years or thousands of years, another species will take over and will probably do what we are doing to animals now and to the planet Earth in general. So it's a never ending loop. It's a never ending cycle. So the solution is to break this cycle itself rather than just letting humans go extinct and keep the animals. And even if that, there, there's no species that's going to conquer all the other species, 
they're still gonna suffer they're still gonna play this game that 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 has no meaning that uh, has no purpose that is uh, about suffering and uh it's not necessary in the first place so that's why i do not agree with uh, vimt regarding the child free movement uh, i think people who call themselves child free uh, think it's more like a personal choice and they follow this uh, kind of philosophy because they think that it's a personal choice but it's not necessary for them that um, procreation is immoral or procreation is a selfish act or something like that um, some of them do not mind they they say that uh, it's fine for you to procreate but i'm child free by choice so yeah so i i do not agree with this uh movement as well so yeah these are my thoughts about it you've told me in the past that uh you were deeply inspired by polish antinatalism and the activism that's happening there and it really is extraordinary uh and it's so interesting that over the last few years poland really has become sort of one of the world's um hotbeds of antinatalism so much happening there every month now it seems um have you continued to follow the the developments of polish antinatalism yes i'm amazed by poland and by the polish people uh, who are uh, now aware of what's happening and they're following uh, uh, this philosophy, which is very important. And it was unexpected, to be honest, from uh, Poland, because, as you know, it's a country that is uh, maybe full of uh, racism and the right uh, wing of the political parties is affecting them so much. So you do not expect that from such a country because um, it's not a country like uh, uh, France, for example, or uh, England. So I expected more from England or from France than from Poland. But yeah, I can tell that maybe one of the reasons is because they suffered a lot from wars, uh, especially from racism uh, and the... the uh, the the stuff that they have in general i'm following yeah i'm following uh, because there's uh polish antinatalism uh, groups on facebook and i follow what they post uh, i think i have some people from them on my friends list but to be honest i do not remember their names and uh, their names are a little bit difficult to remember so but yeah, amazing job, and uh, I hope they continue like that, and that every country in this world becomes like Poland. What do you see as the connections between antinatalism, ethelism, and veganism? Uh, why should antinatalists care about animal rights? A very good question. Uh, the connection between ethelism, veganism, and antinatalism is that the three of them uh, have one goal, which is... Um, reducing suffering as much as possible or eliminating suffering if it's possible in the first place so you cannot be a vegan and at the same time cause unnecessary harm to somebody else uh, because it doesn't make sense it's uh, there, there's a contradiction here uh, just like you cannot be an antinatalist and cause unnecessary harm to somebody else because there is also a contradiction here so i think that the connection is that antinatalists who are not vegans they cause unnecessary harm to animals who are being bred every single day by millions they breed animals by millions every single day only because humans want to consume their products so it does not make any sense to me to be an antinatalist and a non-vegan at the same time because being an antinatalist only for humans doesn't make sense yeah you're reducing suffering for humans but what about animals because they suffer too they have nervous systems like us they suffer like us they fear pain they don't want to suffer um same goes with vegans who are not antinatalists, like vegan breeders, for example, vegans who uh, bring uh, children to this world, uh, biological children of them, uh, to follow this cause and talk about animal rights. Like this is hypocritical because 
uh, you're causing unnecessary harm to these children and you're giving them these missions that they didn't ask for in the first place. So why don't you adopt children who uh, are in desperate need for this help and then teach them about animal rights, for example. So, yeah, you should be uh, the three of them at the same time, an ethylist, an antinatalist and a vegan uh, to avoid any cognitive dissonance, as they say. Leif, you've also occasionally called yourself a pro-mortalist, and I was curious, how do you define that term? Yes, that's right, uh, pro-mortalism. So I think that term was created by uh, Jun Huang, the one who attempted suicide and uh, he died at the end at the age of 22. Uh, he used to believe that uh, it's better to exit as soon as possible from this world. So the sooner you sign out, the better for you. So that's why uh, he used this term. And uh, I, I agree with this. I agree with this because we suffer on a daily basis, whether it's from our daily routine life or whether whether the suffering is, is, is mild or whether the suffering is huge. We suffer on a daily basis. And we were forced for this. We didn't ask for this. So this life was imposed on us. So yeah, the sooner we get out of it, the better. But at the same time, I used to call myself an, a, a promortalist pro and I still agree with this term, but why did I remove it from my Facebook bio is because uh, I'm not willing to end my life now because uh, first of all, it's not guaranteed and uh, I thought about it a lot before. Uh, secondly, uh, there's no euthanasia yet legalized for everyone. And third, even if there was euthanasia legalized for me, I think that my activism matters more and it's more important to uh, deliver this message of antinatalism to everyone. So by that, I'm going to save more potential generations of, of children in the future not to come to this world which is going to be much better than ending my own life. So, yeah, that's why I removed this term. So, Laith, you truly are, I feel, our ambassador to the Arabic antinatalist world for the rest of us. Uh, and for most, for most of us, it's a section of the antinatalist community that most outside of it, outside of the Arabic antinatalist world, don't know anything about, uh, which is ironic because I think it could be argued that the Arabic antinatalist world is quite possibly the largest and most active um, antinatalist community out there. So again, as our ambassador, I wanted to ask you just a few questions in regards to all this to help guide our audience uh, and give everybody a bit of context and to understand the Arabic antinatalist world better. Before we go on, and I know I've asked you to do this in the past, uh, but could you tell me how to say antinatalism in Arabic? Uh, and there are multiple ways, yes? Uh, what are the differences? Can you say a couple different versions? Sure, sure thing, Amanda. Um, antinatalism in Arabic, you can say it in many different ways, many different forms. You can say ضد التناسل, which means anti-procreation. You can say ضد الإنجاب, which means also anti-procreation or antinatalism. And you can say اللا إنجابية, uh, which is antinatalism as well. So it's because Arabic, the language itself, is rich of words, uh, has a lot of uh, words and vocabs, it's, it's rich. So that's why we, we always have alternative words to say the word antinatalism. You informed me recently that there are many dialects of Arabic, which is something that I did not know until very recently. Um, and some of those dialects are so divergent in different from your own that you can't understand uh, those that speak those forms of Arabic. So a bit of an odd question, but do you think that there are other words in Arabic for antinatalism in those other dialects? Yes, it depends on the geographical area. So 
the, the Arab world is, is just like any other world, uh, uh, like the, the world of English speakers. For example, the difference between people who speak English in the United States and people who speak English in Australia, uh, they, they do understand each other, but there are some certain words and phrases that they might not understand. Um, same goes for English in uh, South Africa or English in uh, England or Scotland, for example. So the Arab world, um, it depends. Countries that are close to each other, they are able to understand each other more in Arabic, um, although they have different accents. So as a Lebanese, I understand people from Syria, from Jordan, from uh, Iraq, somehow, uh, from the Gulf countries, uh, from Egypt. Why from Egypt? Because Egypt is very well known uh, in the Arab world and uh, almost most of the media and the movies and the series are in Egyptian. The songs are in Egyptian. So we understand this accent very well. But the accents that are a little bit difficult are the accents of people from Morocco, Algeria, Mauritania, because uh, their Arabic is a little bit mixed with uh, Spanish, French and other languages. So, yeah, they mix a lot and it's uh, very difficult to understand them, especially people from Morocco and Algeria. Uh, when they speak, I understand almost 20% of what they say, not more than that. But yeah, I do not think that there are other words for antinatalism in Arabic. Um, but they might mix it with French and say the word antinatalism in French because Algeria was occupied by France for a very long time. Uh, so that's why they are so uh, affected by France. So they might use some word that that is related to French, but not in Arabic. No, these are the only ones that I mentioned as far as I know. I'm very interested in trying to chart sort of how the Arabic anti-natalist world first began. And I know that that's kind of a history that has not yet been sort of laid out. Um, the earliest that I have found is a blog uh, in Arabic from 2013 called life uh, hyphen stupid dot blogspot dot com. Um, I don't know much of anything about it. Can you tell me something about it and about the history a little bit? Yes, sure. So that blog was written in 2013, as you said, Amanda, and the person who wrote it, um, he explained uh, antinatalism in it and uh, he responded to some arguments and uh, people who tried to justify natalism and justify giving birth in the first place. So he responded to them uh, by debunking their arguments. Uh, he also um, talked about the delusion of mortality that people believe that by procreating they're gonna stay in this life and uh, f failing to know that or, or failing to reach the conclusion that everyone is gonna die and death is inevitable so it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I do not know much more uh, details about it to be honest, uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry. So besides your page, your famous uh, Arabic page of Ephelism, which we'll talk all about in just a little while here, there are also a number of other very active, very large antinatalist Facebook groups and pages that get a huge amount of attention, a huge amount of engagement. Uh, the largest one is antinatalism in Arabic. That's the UR, what the URL says. I don't know exactly how to say um, the actual title of the page. Um, at this very moment, that page has 86,000 followers, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, what can you tell me about this group? Yes, that's right. So uh, this Facebook page, which is the largest one in the uh, antinatalist Arabic community and maybe in the antinatalist world, um, as you said, it has more than 86,000 followers and it was created by... Uh, a friend of mine from another Arab country 
but I'm sorry, I cannot mention the name of uh, his country and I cannot mention his name because uh, he doesn't like to be on media or to, to he doesn't like to seek any attention for him personally. So, um, but he's a very, very good friend of mine and I speak to him um, regularly. Uh, he created the page back in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. And the reason why it gained so much followers and engagement is because uh, his words, his Arabic language is amazing. The way he preaches antinatalism, the, the quotes he uses for philosophers around the world, uh, antinatalist philosophers, whether it's for Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, Emil Sioran, uh, Thomas Ligotti and others, uh, the way he, he, he um, adds everything to the reader and uh, the way he shows it is amazing. And uh, that's why it has um, too much uh, followers. Uh, and uh, he's an antinatalist because of uh, he, he was so deep into this philosophy. So when you have antinatalists who think, who are critical thinkers, who think about everything and they explain everything in their posts and publications, so that means that uh, it's it's something amazing. It's it's not like people who are antinatalists because they only hate children, for example, or they only don't want to have children for some reason. For um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's what I can explain about uh, this Facebook page. In general, what countries do most of the people come from in these groups? Um, I know in the past you've said that Egypt is number one. Uh, is that still true? Uh, that's an interesting question. If we're talking about social media itself, uh, I can tell that uh, maybe it's Egypt because uh, most of the people who uh, react on the posts of uh, the page of uh, aphelism in Arabic on Facebook are from Egypt. Uh, there's also a very big number from uh, Morocco and Algeria as well. Uh, and I think they're the biggest uh, uh, three countries, uh, like people from these three countries who are antinatalists. But I cannot give you the exact right information because yeah, I, I haven't done the statistics and I do not know much. Uh, especially that there are a lot of antinatalists maybe who are not active on social media or who do not uh, show their identity. So we cannot know the exact uh, number or from which country um, most antinatalists come from. Uh, yeah. Are you worried moving forward as this gets more and more popular, uh, what's going to happen uh, in those countries? Do you think that this is something that's going to start getting people into trouble? Yes, unfortunately, because it's a taboo in the Middle East uh, and in North Africa. You, you cannot really speak about uh, these topics publicly in front of people. You can, but in the end, you're going to pay the price, maybe. Uh, because of the consequences, especially with your parents, if your parents are closed minded, if they come from uh, a society that is so terrible, like most of these societies in the Middle East and uh, North uh, Africa. So in some cases, speaking about antinatalism is going to get you in trouble much more than speaking about atheism because uh, some families in the Middle East and North Africa accept you being an atheist somehow but if you speak about human extinction uh, telling people not to procreate this is gonna be worse for them so I, I do not understand why but it's uh, maybe it goes back to traditions culture and so on uh, it's very dangerous, especially at the moment. It's, it's very, very dangerous. 
but I'm happy to see that there are a lot of people with uh, with this kind of uh, encouragement and courage that they have. They are so brave that they're speaking about it in public. Uh, people from Egypt, people from different countries. So I'm happy to see that that people are increasing. People now are breaking the uh, the wall of fear which is very important. Despite whatever challenges and dangers there may be, how do you explain the popularity of antinatalism? Why is this growing in these countries? Why is this getting so popular in those places? I believe that uh, antinatalism is getting much more popular in the Arab world is because of uh, injustice in these countries, is because of oppression, is because of... Uh, the little hope they have in humanity or in their governments and regimes in these countries. Um, people who suffer a lot and who experience a lot of pain and harm in such countries should reach this conclusion at the end, uh, the conclusion of antinatalism. And that's what's happening. People are more aware of what's happening now. They are more open to the world, to the internet, to everything. Um, and once they get out from, the, from their religious backgrounds, they start to think for themselves more and more. So I think this is the reason why uh, the antinatalist community is becoming bigger and bigger in the Arab world. Also because on the other side, there are a lot of people who do not care, who keep breeding uh, tens of children. So, so for every action, there is a reaction, as they say. So it can be also because of that. When we spoke together on Eiffel TV antinatalist television, there had recently been some really quite shocking displays of antinatalist and ethelist activism in parts of the world in which it really is quite dangerous for somebody to do those things. Um, can you tell me about some of those incidents, particularly the activists in the Sudan with their sign? Has there been anything like that since? Uh, were there any consequences to them then? And somebody also did something similar in Algeria, correct? Yes, yes, of course. So what happened is that there were some uh, demonstrations in Sudan and in Algeria against their governments, against the authority. And uh, I had two Facebook friends on Facebook from Sudan where uh, both of them participated in one of the demonstrations and they they were holding banners written on them antinatalism and ethelism and as far as i remember the word was in english as well uh, and i think they wrote it in english so that people in sudan do not understand what they mean in general so that they do not uh, cause them any problems. Uh, I'm not sure if I still have uh, these two Facebook friends on my uh, Facebook friend list. Uh, unfortunately, I have many people on my friends list, so I do not remember. But yeah, they, they did an amazing job and I was so happy to see their pictures there. Regarding Algeria, yeah, uh, as well. Uh, but the people who uh, were with the signs in Algeria, uh, I do not know them, to be honest. They're anonymous. Uh, they didn't say their name. They just uh, uh, posted it uh, anonymous, uh, anonymously. <laughs> and uh, what was written on it was in Arabic. It, it said, Naam lid-demokratiya na'am lillah injabiya which means yes to democracy yes to antinatalism so that's if i translate it literally and uh, as far as i know uh, nothing else happened uh, recently or later on uh, that's as far as i know if i'm not mistaken but i hope to see some of these movements very very soon in the arab world especially in these countries
In the Arabic community, do you typically see people identify as antinatalists or ethalists? Do any identify as vehement or child-free or anything else, perhaps? Yes, yes, it happens. Uh, it's just like uh, the world in general. Like you see people defining themselves child-free uh, from uh, ethalists, antinatalists, vehement. Uh, so it's the same. It's the same for the Arab world, yes. You see, you see all types of people from the antinatalist community, of course, but they're not so deep into into uh, this philosophy itself that it it has these parts. And maybe most of the antinatalists in the Arab world do not know the differences between ethelism, vimt, and child free. They just call themselves uh, antinatalists for some reason. I'm curious as to what role religion may or may not play in these groups. Are there any religious antinatalists that are part of these communities? Uh, and are they primarily comprised of ex-religious people, particularly ex-Muslims? Um, would you say that the groups primarily consist of atheists? Yes, uh, these groups are mainly atheists. And uh, it's very rare to find somebody who's religious and an antinatalist at the same time, especially in the Arab world. Because as you know, the Abrahamic religions, uh, monotheistic religions, all of them uh, encourage procreation in a way or another. Although they have some verses, whether they are in the Quran or in the Bible, that uh, uh, talks shit about uh, uh, procreation. Um, I don't know, these books contradict themselves as well. But yeah, uh, it's very rare to find some uh, religious antinatalists. And if there are, uh, they do not really stick to their religion. They do not really follow the religion as it is. They take some parts of it, the parts that they like, and the parts that they do not like, they change it and they become an antinatalist. Uh, so yeah, uh, most of the people from the antinatalist community in the Arab world are ex-Muslims because, you know, uh, Islam is the majority in the Arab world and they come from this uh, religious, ex-religious background. Has antinatalism appeared in Middle Eastern media at all? And if so, what are some of the examples? Yes, antinatalism appeared many times in uh, the media and the media channels in the Arab world. Um, it appeared before, I do not remember the year to be honest, but, but I guess it was three or four years ago. It appeared on a channel called France 24, which is uh, France uh, 24. Um, I think this channel is in France, but uh, they have like an Arabic version for the Arab world. And they had an episode uh, in a program that they have about antinatalism. They spoke about antinatalism. They had uh, people from different Arab countries who had a debate about antinatalism. It was interesting. But unfortunately, the media uh, uses antinatalism in a way where they do not want to show that antinatalists are on the right side. So they try to uh ruin the reputation of antinatalism uh in their smart way of showing uh, the, the the how how the philosophy works uh recently i was hosted on a podcast uh, for a syrian media channel which is called al mayadin by someone called Rihan Yunan. She's very famous. Uh, she has uh, thousands of followers uh, on her Facebook page. And uh, she did, she created uh, a short uh, video about antinatalism in general that I helped her with uh, for like seven or eight minutes. And now it has more than 60,000 views, which is amazing, amazing number. And uh, I think very soon uh, uh, an, an episode of a program called uh, Jafar Talk or Shabab Talk, is, it's going to be published soon. 
uh, about antinatalism as well. Are there any Arabic speaking antinatalist or ethelist content producers that you could recommend? Yes, uh, there are. I recommend Omar Ali. He's, uh, he's from Egypt and he translates uh, videos about antinatalism and ethelism mainly from English to Arabic or from other languages to Arabic. Uh, he has been very active, but uh, he doesn't also like to be mentioned uh, publicly, you know, because of some problems that he might face because of the society in general and um, I'm sorry, I feel sorry for him because of that but yeah, um, there's no escape for now um, he does very amazing work for antinatalism for the community itself there was also an Iraqi poet his name was Musab I do not remember his last name but he used to write some very good poems about antinatalism back in the days, maybe three or four years ago, and uh, he disappeared. So I do not know anything about him now. I have to check him out on Facebook to see if he's still there. I have to ask about him because, you know, in Iraq, the situation is horrible. So it's even worse to speak about antinatalism in Iraq or about anything that is against the their traditions and so on uh, yeah there are some there are some more people who who produce stuff there's Mustafa Godem as well uh, he produced some uh, videos about antinatalism in Arabic explaining antinatalism um, uh, replying to some people who give excuses for breeding and he did a very good job he's from Egypt what can the rest of the antinatalist community do to help the Arabic antinatalists and to make our community more whole, more cohesive, and more all together? That's a very good question, but unfortunately I do not have an answer for this question because the antinatalist community in the world that is outside the antinatalist Arabic community, uh, they do not have the power yet to help or to do something about it they do not have the authority so maybe in the near future once uh, we have the uh, power to do something as organizations as as people who can affect or can who make a change uh, by helping the antinatalists in the arab world maybe we can provide the antinatalists in the arab world with uh, uh, some amount of money to make their own organization to to be uh, powerful and to start making some change but yeah this is gonna be so difficult and I don't think that this is gonna happen in the near future because of uh, the situation in the whole world unfortunately Laith, your Arabic page of Ephelism is a phenomenon in its own right. It is without question one of the largest antinatalist groups or pages on Facebook, which is really pretty extraordinary. How on earth did this happen? Yes, the Facebook page of uh, Ephelism in Arabic has uh, more than 20,000 followers and it's very famous now. And this happened uh, suddenly um maybe when i shared the post as i remember uh it was very very uh, touching about ethelism back in 2018 when i established uh, this facebook page so i established it in april 2018 and it didn't gain many followers until july or august so I had to wait for like four to five months and then one of the posts gained thousands of reactions and likes. If I'm not mistaken, more than 8,000 likes. So then people started liking the page and following uh, the content and they loved it. Um, so that's how it started. 
you and I have kind of talked about this before, but a bit of another odd phenomenon attached to the Arabic page of Ephelism is that it's an Ephelist page, but the members in general don't really have much familiarity with Amendum at all, and they really haven't seen any of his videos. Is that true? And yeah, regarding Amendum and uh, his videos, yeah, they do not know much about the philosophy itself and that the philosophy itself is from Amendum. I shared some videos for Amandam and I translated some from English to Arabic because he was speaking in English, of course. Uh, and some people know about him, but the majority of people who follow the page, they have no clue about Amandam. Uh And they have no clue who, who, who's the one who came up with this philosophy. Although I tried a, a lot of times and many times uh, to share this. Uh, by sharing quotes for Amandam, by sharing videos of him. Uh, but yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit funny that some people follow uh, a philosophy without knowing about the person who came up with this philosophy. But it's interesting at the same time because what's important is that they are ethelists, which is which is important. In addition to that, how much access in the Middle East in general do antinatalists have to other antinatalist works, such as Better Never to Have Been by David Benatar, or anything else for that matter? As far as I know, nobody yet translated uh, David Benatar's book Better Never to Have Been to Arabic, but there are some uh, parts of it that are translated to Arabic by some people, some of his quotes in the book, but not the book itself. Uh, but the last Messiah, for example, uh, by Peter Gusil Zapf was translated to Arabic, as far as I remember, by a guy called Ismail, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure about my information, about the, the information that I have, because I forget a lot recently. <laughs> but yeah, as far as I know, uh, this book was translated to Arabic, and it's not that huge, so it was easy to translate it. But um, I'll be happy to see uh, more work, more volunteers, more translators who are willing to do so. And I would love to do so when I have the time, uh, hopefully in the near future. So without the direct influence of either Benatar or in Mendem, what do people on really all of these Arabic antinatalist or Ephelist pages believe? Um, do you feel that the Ephelism on the page of Ephelism, the Arabic page of Ephelism, differs greatly from the Ephelism envisioned originally by in Mendem? I love this question. It's a very, very good question. I do believe that uh, most of the people who follow the page of Ephelism are Ephelists in a way that they believe that life itself causes harm and that procreation is immoral uh, and that's it. But they're not so deep into that, uh, yeah, all sentient suffer and stuff like that. Some of them know and some of them are also against animals procreating, but not all of them. So, um, I'm not sure if we can call them Ephelists if they do not really follow uh, all the parts of the philosophy. But uh, I am planning to um, I'm planning to share more content of more stuff about Amendum and uh, maybe your movie Amanda, the Ephelist that should be translated to Arabic, and I should translate it, and I wanted to, but uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity yet, but I will translate it soon to Arabic so that they know more about the philosophy itself, which is important. Outside of yourself, have there been other attempts to translate in Mendem videos into Arabic? Sure, sure. Outside of myself, uh, Omar Ali has translated, I think, more than two or three videos by Amandam to Arabic, and he has done amazing work. Like antinatalism, do you feel that Ephelism might have different versions of itself uh, in some ways, particularly because of the language barriers? I often sometimes suspect that something similar might also be true with Indian antinatalism or Indian Ephelism. Now, because of the language barriers, I do not think that Ephelism has... Uh, 
uh, parts like antinatalism. Uh, but I think that people do not really understand the philosophy itself as it is because of the language barriers and because they do not have enough information about it. So once they know, they are going to understand. And uh, I don't think that ephelism itself can also be divided unless if we're talking about the solution to, to, uh, of, of the red button. Like some people are with pressing this red button if it's done painlessly to have this huge mass extinction for everybody. And some people are against it if it's not done painlessly. Uh, some do not mind. They say even if it's painful, but let's just end it and it's going to end. Even if it's painful, it's just for a few seconds and yeah, that's it. So yeah, maybe maybe this is the difference between uh, Ephelists. Some believe this way, some believe that way. Are the members there generally interested in animal rights? Uh, and how about the right to die? Is that of great interest? Whoa, a huge number are interested in the right to die movement. A very big number. You cannot believe it. <laughs> like, I believe that there are more uh, people who, who follow the right to die movement in the page of aphilism than people who care about animal rights. A lot of people want euthanasia to happen as soon as possible, to be legalized in the whole world as soon as possible, especially in the Arab world. A lot of people message me on a daily basis asking me how to die painlessly, uh, asking me about methods, asking me about uh, materials that they can use, liquids, stuff like that, chemical stuff that they can end, where they can end their lives. Uh, painlessly unfortunately they suffer a lot because of this and that's why we see a lot of uh, suicide attempts in the arab world on a daily basis thousands of people try to attempt suicide because they have no hope it's so sad but yeah this is the truth when I interviewed you for Eiffel TV, we certainly spoke all about your Arabic page of Ethelism. I can't believe that was actually two years ago now, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, what's changed in those last two years? Yes, yes, we spoke a lot about uh, the page at that time, I remember. Uh, the last two years, uh, it changed that uh, it had uh, 13,000 uh, followers, as I remember, two years ago, and now it has 20,000 followers. So seven more thousand followers, which is, which is good. But I was expecting that... Uh, I was expecting it to gain more followers, maybe to reach 30,000 or 35,000 by this time. But yeah, unfortunately... Things do not always go with uh, how we want them to go. And uh, yeah, nothing else. I'm still posting on it, but I'm not active as much as I used to be before. I do not know why. I should uh, maybe refresh it and start to post more on it. Do you think that there's a possibility that the Ephelists from your page or some of the antinatalists from some of the other large Arabic antinatalist pages and groups will collect eventually and try to organize outside of the internet eventually? Um, do you see much potential or energy in that direction so far? Yes, I do think that they have the potential and they have the passion and they are willing to do so and they would love to because I see many posts on uh, the Facebook groups of Ephelism and Antinatalism where they talk about uh, meeting, where they talk about organizing stuff, coordinating stuff. But uh, yeah, maybe because of the situation of COVID and so on, it's not easy to do so uh, currently, but in the near future, I'm hoping so. One of the most recent wonderful additions to your page of Ephelism in recent times has been your show, The Opposite Thought. How did this project start? Uh, what inspired you? True, true. That's correct. So uh, the uh, program of The Opposite Thought uh, was established or started actually in July 2020, which is last year. And... Uh, 
how did I think about it? Is it's because uh, I always wanted people to listen to different views, to the opposite thought, uh, as it says in the name of the program. So I, I was thinking of this idea of hosting people from different views, uh, putting them together in a Zoom call, and opening the debate between them to start debating and then I ask them questions for each one of them and uh, I did that on purpose to be to be neutral in this uh, program although I'm an antinatalist and an atheist and so on but just to uh, because I'm the one who's interviewing them so it's better to be neutral always in these programs. Uh, and it was interesting. I covered uh, 15 uh, episodes of it, but unfortunately I did not continue. Uh, it started in July. The last episode was in January. So 15 episodes in both languages, Arabic and English was interesting. And uh, I think... Uh, it was an important uh, step to take to to do this program. I love that there are some episodes in Arabic and that there are some episodes in English. I think that's wonderful that you're bringing like a multi-language approach to the show. Who have some of your guests been and what have been some of your favorite episodes? Yes, it's interesting. Uh, some of the guests, uh, the, the special ones uh, were uh, the caveman. Uh, and he's very, very well known in the Arab world. Uh, he has a YouTube channel called The Caveman Talks. It has more than 28,000 uh, subscribers, as far as I know. And uh, he's a very good philosopher. He speaks about uh, everything regarding philosophy in general. One of the episodes was about uh, procreation. Is procreation ethical or not? So the caveman was there and another person from Jordan participated in it. By the way, the caveman is Syrian and he lives in Sweden. And the episode was very interesting. Another episode was very good when I hosted uh, Glinos and um, an Indian woman who's spiritual and believes in spirituality and so on. And Glinos came up with amazing amazing antinatalist arguments very strong arguments that she couldn't answer she was posing like that didn't know what to say so yeah he did an amazing job and i think that this episode is uh, is amazing and i recommend it for people to watch it um also, you, Amanda, did a great job when you were in the episode with Arthur, uh, which, which was the second episode of this program, and it was the first episode in English. I hosted you, and you did an amazing job. Although, before the episode, you were telling me, I'm not a good debater, uh, I, I'm, I'm not so good in this, but yeah, let's give it a try, and you were... <laughs> spectacular you were electrifying and you did your best and arthur in some parts of the episode he didn't know what to say and he told you i do not know i i remember one of your questions to him he paused like that in silence for like five seconds and then he said i do not know so amazing job amanda and uh yeah thank you for being part of it and uh i would love to continue this program in the near future when i do have the time for it uh, unfortunately now there's not much time so now late i'd like to ask you a little bit about antinatalism international we are both co-founders of antinatalism international uh, what have you enjoyed most about working with your fellow founders of a and i so far antinatalism international this is like the best project that I have done in my life, to be honest. I'm so proud of uh, the founders. Uh, you're really amazing, all of you, the, the five of you. I'm so happy to be part of this project. And what I enjoyed the most, and I'm still enjoying until now, is that we never had uh, a tension or a fight or something like that. We are one hand. We work together as a team. We work together with passion. 
this is the most important thing and I hope we remain like that uh, in the future as well without any problems um, and yeah I'm, I'm so happy that I met all of you guys and uh, that we still have this weekly meetings uh, every week for it's it's been like a year since we are meeting like that and uh, I hope we can achieve more in the future expand the organization even more and be much more famous to reach our goals. What are your long-term goals working with a and and for your future antenatalist projects and beyond? This is a good question. My long-term goals is to, uh, first of all, reach all our goals, all what we want to do for antenatalism, uh, to have the power, to have the authority, to start making decisions, taking decisions without any fear, uh, without any hesitation and to achieve what we want to do. Uh, for example, regarding uh, our section for the right to die, at least to help these organizations, the right to die movements, to uh, be more powerful, to let them reach as much people as possible, and that we can, for example, cover the costs of uh, vasectomy for as much people as possible, whether it's in the Arab world or in the, in the world in general, as, as, as an organization, Antinatalism International, um, that we are capable, uh, we have the right budget to do whatever we want. So this is the most important thing for us. Leif, in your opinion, what does the future of antinatalism look like? And what do you think the future of ethalism looks like? I do not have much hope for the future of uh, ethalism or much expectations because people, even if people are convinced with this philosophy, uh, they're not going to preach it as much as they preach antinatalism because, you know, you cannot tell animals not to procreate, for example, but it's good that people know about it. Regarding antinatalism, I see a very big future for antinatalism. I see it a uh, social justice movement that is going to be one of the biggest social justice movement, just like the LGBTQ community now, where they can have demonstrations freely in France and other countries in Europe in the United States. Thousands of people join, thousands of people demonstrate. So that's how I see antinatalism is going to be in future. Because, yeah, it's a social justice movement and uh, many people are going to join, whether it's from the Arab world or from different countries. And uh, some laws are going to be changed. Uh, we're going to put so much pressure on governments to let them uh, force uh, or let them stick to some laws. And this is very important. What has the reaction to a and I been like on all of the Arabic antinatalism pages? Have you seen much interest and engagement in anything that we're doing? Yes, I remember when I uh, first published uh, the announcement of uh, our grand opening in November uh, on the Ethelism page that there's something coming soon for it's called Antinatalism International. It's the biggest organization for antinatalism in the world and stuff like that. People were so excited, were it engaging on that post and uh, more than 100 people reacted on that post. Uh, also, when, um, when we were almost done with this and I uploaded my, I changed my profile picture on my Facebook profile, uh with with the picture that was uh, in blue with all the founders like us uh and uh many people reacted on it more than 100 as well and they were so happy and excited they were wishing me luck in this organization uh but unfortunately recently i do not see much uh, reaction um i do not know why maybe because of the language barrier but we also upload uh videos in arabic for example speaking about the excuses in the handbook and uh yeah there's not much reaction unfortunately one of the people who used to react a lot uh who was called nihilism gene um he died and uh, yeah, it was, it was a big shock and a big loss for me and for the community itself in the Arab world, for the antinatalism community. 
One form of activism that both of us, both you and I, have a great interest in is, of course, right to die activism. And I know that you have a lot of thoughts about how to extend right to die activism in the Middle East. Can you tell me about uh, just some of the things that you hope will happen uh, with this subject moving forward in the future uh, within the Middle East and what, how you'd like to sort of help that along? Yes, of course, this is a very important subject. And I wish in the near future I can be able to provide help and the assisted uh, dying uh, to, to all the people who are suffering, uh, to all the people who send me messages begging me, uh, trying to find a way to end their lives uh, painlessly. So I hope in the future I can, for example, contact Dignitas and have the uh, ability to provide these people all the right uh, atmosphere to end their lives uh, painlessly through Dignitas or other clinics, other hospitals, I do not know. But I'm really looking forward to that because I, I do suffer when I see these people suffering as well. And I think that our responsibility and our moral obligation is to help them and to provide them with help as much as possible, as much as we can. I know that I'm not a doctor, uh, I'm not an expert, I do not know the method, I do not know what to do in, in some cases, but we should keep fighting for this until it's legalized in all the countries, without any exception, in all the countries, in all the world, for any case, whether they suffer from mental illness, whether they do not suffer from mental illness, whether they have uh, health problems or not. It's a right, it's a human right for everyone and nobody should deny that because we're not causing any harm by uh, ending our own lives painlessly. We're not forcing anyone to do anything. So yeah, I, I look forward to this. So now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the handbook that you wrote alongside uh, one of the other founders of Antinatalism International, Lawrence Anton. Uh, the book is called An Antinatalist Handbook, Responses to Common Natalist Excuses. Yes, I'm happy that uh, we have written uh, two editions of uh, the handbook uh, that is about uh, debunking the uh, arguments that uh, breeders and natalists give uh, the, the common excuses that they have against antinatalism. Uh, the, the amazing guy, Lawrence Anton, I thank him for everything, for all the effort he put uh, in general uh, all the time, whether it's for this handbook or for antinatalism in general, for the philosophy, uh, for our organization. He did an amazing job and uh, he's the one who did most of the job, to be honest, most of the work uh, for the handbook. Yes, we worked together. Yes, we wrote the excuses together. But I, I, without him, I wouldn't have done anything. So I thank him for this. And as far as I remember, we came up with this uh, idea randomly, like suddenly when we were talking about it. And uh, I do not really remember the details. Maybe Lawrence knows more about this. But uh, yeah, we are looking forward for more editions in the future. So you have now written two different volumes of this handbook alongside Lawrence. How did this project come about? So the book is simply about uh, debunking uh, these excuses that people have in general against antinatalism. And what we expect that people who read this book and understand the book, uh, the, all the editions of, of the book, uh, they should reach a conclusion that there is no good excuse or any justification, any moral justification that uh, helps in justifying uh, having children or breeding in general. So that's what we hope, that people should be convinced by the time they finish reading the editions. Because if not, then what's the excuse? What stops them from being antinatalists? What stops them from... Uh, taking this decision. Uh, yeah, if they have any excuse that that is not mentioned in the book, then let them come with it and we can debunk it uh, easily. 
So yeah, that's what we're hoping. Uh, and I think these kinds of books help a lot for the movement because the same idea, but uh, the, for the vegan version, Earthling Ed uh, uh, came up with a, a book for debunking excuses that non-vegans give and stuff like that. And uh, I think it's very important because, yeah, so once you debunk all these excuses, what other excuses do you have? What is your reason now not to be an antinatalist? What can you tell me about the second edition of the handbook? Um, how is it different from the first one? Regarding the second edition, it's just that uh, there are some common excuses that we missed maybe in the first edition uh, that we did not add and we decided to add them and to make a second edition. So that's the difference. Um, so the first edition is made of 30 excuses. The second one is of 15 excuses. So in total, there are 45 excuses. And uh, hopefully, uh, very soon in the third edition, we're going to include more excuses that are somehow common. They're not as common as the excuses in the first edition and the second edition, but we also hear some excuses from uh, people uh, who talk about it. And uh, yeah, the more excuses we have, the better. The more excuses we're gonna debunk, the better. So let's see where, where it's gonna end. If we're gonna have also a fourth edition, a fifth edition, we still do not know. We should uh, discuss this and see. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the movie Capernaum. Uh, I'm probably saying the name of the film wrong. I apologize. It was a movie by Nadine Lavahi. Uh, what did this movie uh, mean, if anything, to the antinatalist Arabic world? Do you know if anybody has tried to contact Nadine Lavahi about the antinatalism of this film? Yes, Kafar Nahum. This movie was an amazing movie. Uh... About antinatalism, it has very direct antinatalism messages, antinatalist messages, sorry. And uh, as you know, you watch the movie, Amanda, and it's a very good movie. Uh, people should think about this movie once they watch it, and they should think about antinatalism in an indirect way, because it, it focuses on this part a lot, because it shows you how real life is and how children suffer for no good reason. Uh, unfortunately, I do not know anybody who contacted uh, Nadine Labaki uh, regarding uh, this film uh, about antinatalism. Uh, but the thing is that I know that some people uh, were commenting that she only focused on the poor, that she's against the poor people having children but she has no problem with rich people having children. But I didn't hear any statement from her. I didn't hear any claim from her. So I cannot uh, claim that. But yeah, some people said, uh, why is she only against uh, poor people having children, but she's okay with rich people having children. But she didn't say that. So we cannot assume that she said that without only, only by people analyzing this after watching the movie. But I think it's a very good movie and I recommend it for everyone to watch it. Although it's sad, it's heartbreaking, but uh, yeah, it's an amazing movie. Laith, you are a kind, gentle, wonderful human being. You work harder to be a good person than most people I have ever met. Um, your presence in my life has made me a happier, better person just to know you. Really grateful for all the work that you do uh, and for your friendship and uh, so excited to continue to work with you on our antinatalism and ephilism related projects together. It's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, as my guest today. Thank you so much, my friend, for being my guest on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Thanks to you, Amanda, for everything. Thank you for your time, for this opportunity, for hosting me. I really enjoyed speaking to you about this, and uh, I hope we can do much more uh, together soon uh, regarding activism and in our organization, Antinatalism International. Thank you again, and uh, have a good time, everybody. 
Make sure to subscribe to Leif on YouTube, follow his Arabic page of Ephelism, watch the video of his incredible lecture, and check out our other interview together on Eiffel TV Anti-Natalist Television. Links below. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Anti-Natalism podcast. This has been Amanda Oldfan Suknik and Mark J. Maharaj. You can find us on YouTube on the channels Forever Wolf Films and Question Mark, respectively. Keep up with my daily anti-natalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and email us at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on the YouTube channel Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, as well as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and so many more. Our website, www.exploringantinatalism.com, was designed by the amazing Visions Noirs. Please visit Visions Noirs at www.bionoir.com and find more of his links below. Logo art by The Incredible Life Sucks. Please visit his YouTube channel, and if you would perhaps like to purchase one of the new Exploring Antinatalism t-shirts by Life Sucks, please visit his Etsy page at www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. And proudly announcing, our new theme music has been graciously provided by I Doubt It. I Doubt It is an alum of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, so please go listen to his episode, episode four, and visit his amazing YouTube channel. All the best, and bye for now. Mm -hmm.